I'm going to tell you a little bit about the disease in general, give, give you an introduction for those who have not heard. This is similar to the talk I gave a year ago. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the management of low blood pressure. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to just, again, Vicky Conti, Judy, Vera made this happen. I'm going to first define uh, the brain regions, what we're dealing with in terms of what this disease actually does. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about practical tips and suggestions really just on blood pressure. And then Dr. Sandroni will cover practical tips for bowel and bladder. And then Dr. Heiner will cover uh, what <coughs> happens to the movement disorder, why the movement is the way it is. And then Julie will talk about uh, what we're doing, uh, with why the physical therapy is so important and what can be done. Okay, so what is MSA? I think most of you know this at this point, but it's a disease that causes the brain to lose certain brain cells, and it produces either a Parkinson's-like uh, movement problem or ataxia, which means loss of uh, ability to maintain your balance and to navigate. Uh, it causes urinary issues. It causes a major sleep disorder, uh, and uh, it causes uh, a drop in um, blood pressure. So uh, just by history, Originally, these were thought to be two separate diseases, and they look very different. But the fact that they both have such severe autonomic problems, meaning loss of blood pressure, loss of bladder function, is what uh, made people start to think that they were, they were the same disease. So in 1900, <coughs> uh, the, the ataxic form was described. In 1961 and 1960, Shy and Drager described the Parkinson's form. That's why you've probably heard the name Shy Drager. But that, strictly speaking, refers to the Parkinsonian form. And then um, in 1969, uh, so that's pretty recent if you think about it. That's 1970. That's just uh, 40 years ago. Uh, it was realized that this was one disease. And even more recently, just 20-some years ago, um, it was proven that this was one disorder because when you look at the brain, the, the findings in the brain are exactly the same uh, for both disorders. And this is the finding. Um, the finding is uh, in B, you see this kind of big, ugly looking thing uh, which is sitting uh, in uh, a cell called the glia. So that's, uh, we call those glial cytoplasmic inclusions. It means that they're inside the glia. Uh, and just so you understand, the brain has two fundamental types of nerve cells, neurons that do the job of what we do every day, thinking, seeing, that kind of thing, and glia that do a much more, well, I shouldn't say more important, but equally important job, which is to shape the brain. So when you learn, when you grow, when you notice that you know, this year, you've kind of learned something and you've reacted to something differently than you did two years ago, that's because your brain and the circuits have been shaped differently than they were two years ago, and that's the job of the glia. So the glia, there's nine glia to every one neuron. So a big difference between Parkinson's disease and uh, multiple system atrophy is that in Parkinson's, the problem is in the neurons, the cells that talk to each other. And in uh, in multiple system atrophy, the problem is in the glia. Glia means glue. So it was thought way back when that just kind of, they're just, you know, they're just there for glue. They're just holding the brain together. But that's a very short-sighted way of thinking about glia. They actually do all the work of the growing, developing brain. And without them, those neurons would just be the same today as they were when we were one years old. Um, so we've got two different types. MSAP, as it's known today, which is Shai Drager, uh, which is the Parkinsonian type. And we've got MSAC, which is a cerebellar type. And uh, you can see it's about two-thirds to one-third. So it's the MSAC is less common. And then you've got a few who have both. But that's very unusual. That's probably less than 5% have both. So I wanted to describe a very important concept in the brain, which is what a synapse is. So you can understand a little bit better what's happening <coughs> in your brain. Uh, to cause a problem. So the way the brain works fundamentally, the neuronal, now the neuron part of the brain, uh, when cells are talking to each other, let's say I decide I want to move my thumb. So I make the decision. Somewhere in here I say, okay, I'm going to move my thumb. Then a signal gets transmitted 
from that part of the brain to a part of the um, uh, cortex, which is the motor cortex, and that's right, right about here somewhere, and then it's right about here if I'm moving this side, and then uh, that signal gets transmitted down to the spinal cord, another neuron is there, and that neuron then sends a signal out to my thumb to move. Okay, that's very simplistic. We're talking about thousands of neurons, obviously, who are just doing just for the thumb. So the important thing to realize is when you're sleeping, if your brain says, uh, move the thumb, what happens? The thumb doesn't move because you're paralyzed during your dreams. So a synapse is how this happens. So you, you could say, well, why, why isn't it just one wire? Why isn't it just one wire right from the front? Why waste all this? You know, we've got three different cells and they're communicating to each other. Why not just have it? One wire here, boom, really simple. Because that then doesn't give you any option to cut off the signal. You can't stop the signal. So the brain is made up of this very important set of cells and they're connected by this connection we call a synapse. That means, synapse means to bring together. So two cells come together. So you've got one cell on this picture here. You've got one cell coming from the left and another cell which is going to receive the information going on the right and continue that information. And what's not shown here is that there's probably a thousand cells impinging on around that synapse that say, that get a vote. So actually, m our body works by committee. Did you ever realize your body works by committee? So we think, you, you know, they have a saying in China that, uh, uh, it, do you want to get something done or do you want to appoint a committee? Well, somehow in our body, we do both. We actually get something done and we have a committee. So you had a committee of other cells that say, yay or nay, we are going to allow the signal through. And that works to our advantage. A lot of signals we really don't want to hear about. We want some other part of our brain to manage it we, well, so we can go on and do the things that we are important to us. That's why it's so important to have these synapses. The synapse is a chemical. So you've got an electrical transmission all the way down, then you've got a chemical transmission from the one that's talking to the one that's receiving. And let's see if there's sound on. Yeah, I know there's no sound, so, but let's see, maybe, maybe you can hear it. So the one, people, people, yeah, there you go. Okay, so, and so the chemical <laughs> is going from one to the other, and once enough chemicals, and that can be anyone, you may have heard of norepinephrine, acetylcholine, chemicals in the brain, once enough pass from one cell to the other, then the signal gets transmitted. If enough of the committee put inhibitory transmitters in there, the signal will not go through. And that's what maybe happens during sleep when the tr signal of moving the thumb doesn't happen. So that's very important to understand because in MSA, we are losing, so in Parkinson's disease, we're losing the talking cell. And that's why L-DOPA can work in Parkinson's disease, because we can replace the talking cell by replacing the chemical. In that particular case, the chemical is dopamine. In MSA, we're, we're losing the receiving cell. So if we were to replace the chemical, it's not going to do anything, not, at least not for very long, because the cell that would answer to that is not, nothing's happening with it. So that's the um, important point here, is to understand how cells talk and to understand that in MSA, you lose the cell that receives that information about how to move your body. Whereas in Parkinson's, you lose the cell that says how you want to move your body. Okay, now these, this is kind of a, a cut through the brain to show you where this problem is happening. And so this is, of course, the top. Let's see if I can get this there. Okay, top of the brain, and then front, and so in the back. And this is a cut right through the center. So if I would take the brain and cut it like this, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the inner face of the brain. And so there's an area here called the basal ganglia that I'm sure you've heard about. <coughs> and this area is responsible for movement. And Dr. Heino will go into a lot more detail about exactly what it's doing. But this area is where the problems occur, where you're losing that cell that's supposed to receive the information about how you want to move. And then, right in this area, we've got an area, this is called the brainstem. This whole area is a brainstem, and there's a part of the brainstem called the pons. And the pons has a bladder center that allows the bladder to go when it's full and uh, store when, uh, when you want to. 
And that area becomes pretty damaged uh, in multiple system atrophy. Then this area here is an area called the medulla, which is kind of lower part. Just right down, if we were to continue on here, we'd get to the spinal cord. So everybody see where we are in the brain? Okay. Uh, and so this area is an area for controlling of blood pressure. And this area gets very damaged as well. And then finally, if you have the C type of MSA, this area is the cerebellum, and it's responsible for matching your environment with your intentions. So if you intend to move and say you have all of a sudden, you see you had a step you weren't anticipating, that information, visual information would come, and then you'd have a very rapid adjustment for that. It's really almost not conscious. You, you, you could just keep talking while you're doing it because it's all done through the cerebellum. And so if you lose that, you lose the ability to adjust and eventually even to coordinate anything. So these are the four areas, and you can see in MSA, the cortex here, which is the part that's responsible for higher thinking, very, very little involvement. In fact, one of the ways we distinguish Parkinson's disease from MSA is that in MSA, unless you were to test people very subtly, there are some subtle issues, but by and large, the brain remains pretty intact. Okay, and then um, this is uh, epidemiology. It's MSA is thought to be, it's not thought, it is a rare disease. And rare disease is, uh, I think it's uh, defined as under 10 per 100,000. Anyway, MSA is at 4.4 4 per 100,000. There's again the figures of how many are Parkinson's, how many are cerebellar. But if you compare that to Parkinson's disease, it's an amazing difference. Parkinson's disease is almost, if you j it's 1.8 to 2.6, okay? But let's make that 4.4, 4, which is not that difference. 4.4 4 per 100, not 4.4 4 per 100,000. So it's a thousand times, almost a thousand times more common. So, so if somebody comes into Dr. Heiner's office with a movement disorder and autonomic problems, or Dr. Sandroni or me, um, very likely they have Parkinson's just by the odds. So you're a rare disease group, and that's why the advocacy is so important. Parkinson's disease has you know, thousands of people advocating thousands of groups around the country because they have so many more, uh, more people with it. Okay, so then I want to talk about now blood pressure control. So how do we define orthostatic hypotension? Orthostatic hypotension is a drop in blood pressure, and it's been recently confirmed. This is a definition back from 1996, and then we did another definition, I think, a couple years ago, maybe 2011. And uh, it's defined as your systolic blood pressure drops more than 20, or your diastolic blood pressure drops more than 10 millimeters of mercury. And that's a definition for a doctor to make a diagnosis. But it's very unlikely that that drop in blood pressure would produce symptoms in somebody. That just tells me they've got a problem, and I need to know about it from a diagnostic perspective. But it's not going to cause you, because you've got a big range in which you can manage your blood pressure. And so usually, we don't see symptoms until the systolic drops down below 100. So at about 90 or 80, you might start seeing symptoms if your baseline blood pressure were 140. Um, or maybe more than 60 total drops. So if you started at, say, 130 uh, or 140, dropping down to about 80 is when you would see that. Now, interestingly, uh, people who have multiple system atrophy or Parkinson's disease are very resistant to having symptoms. And we were talking about this yesterday in the course. So you tolerate blood pressure drops that are quite astounding. And this is a study. i just show you a little bit of data. A study we did. And, um, uh, a few years ago, and we noticed that when patients with multiple system atrophy or Parkinson's disease would be up on the tilt table, they would drop their blood pressure tr t tremendously, and we'd say, how you doing? Fine. And then here's the blood pressure is looking 70, and, and, and you're, uh, you're, I'm really worried, I, I want to tilt the person back, and say, how you doing? No problems. And then finally, when they hit 67 or 68, oh, I'm starting to feel a little faint, so then we tilt them back. Um, and so you're very, very resistant to that drop in blood pressure. And what this shows is how resistant you are. This group is about, so this total population is about 200 patients, Parkinson's, MSA, diabetes. And only about one third had typical symptoms when they were. So this, this here is a typical group. And this is the blood pressure when they were lying flat, 160 over 75. Blood pressure when they're at their the lowest point, 75 over 25. 
And these, these are this group is having typical symptoms. 88 people were in this group when they dropped that much. And the point of this, uh, this slide is just to show they're not dropping any different. They're all dropping the same. Because you could argue, well, the people that weren't having symptoms just weren't dropping as much. And that is clearly not the case. They're all dropping the same. And uh, this group is dropping dramatically, and they have no symptoms. 88 out of the 200 and some patients we studied. So you're very, very resistant. And that's a good thing, in a way, because it means that you can do way more. Your brain is adjusted to this. It's a bad thing in the sense that you may not be aware that your, the blood flow to your brain is so, uh, is so poor. Now, when you, treat, when you treat a low blood pressure, probably the most important thing is not the drugs. The most important thing is the, what we call non-pharmacologic treatment. For, uh, for low blood pressure. And what this graph shows is how these various non-pharmacologic treatments impact uh, the, the amount of volume, the amount of blood that's reserved that you have in your body. So these abbreviations here, okay, this is uh, placebo, means they, this group compare, this is from uh, um, Netherlands. This group, uh, this is placebo, means they did nothing or took a, salt, uh, uh, took a sugar pill. Uh, this is replenishment with salt. This is HUS stands for head up at night. And this is an exercise program. And uh, over here you see time to passing out. And over here you see uh, how much more volume was available to you in your bloodstream just by doing one of these things. So for example, head of the bed up, here's Somebody, here's a few people that really didn't get any benefit, but the, uh, the majority wound up with about 250 cc's. That's, that's a half a pint more. That's a lot of blood more available to you. And then if they do exercise, you can see the exercise uh, had a very important, very good effect. And salt replenishment had a very important effect. So the point is, these things, if you don't do these things, the drugs are not going to work. So let me just go into these a little bit more detail. So, um, so it's very important if you prescribe salts or if you not prescribe salt to take salt. Work closely with your physician because uh, the salt could also cause your blood pressure to go too high. So you have to figure out exactly what the right amount of salt is that you need to take. That without making your blood pressure go too high, your blood pressure go too low. But one simple tip is that. Um, once you've taken your salt, and if you're on mitodrine or droxydope or whatever it is you're taking, uh, once you've taken that, then you probably should not be lying down. You should probably be sitting or standing for the rest of that, the time. For the four or five hours, that is going to have an impact. So that way, you don't have to worry about the high pressure when you're lying flat. And then uh, you, when that, work, that, that is out of your system at about four or five hours, then you can go ahead and lie flat again. And y you know, you, if you just do a week of checking your blood pressure and kind of see how long these things last and what your pressures are, you'll eventually kind of get it. And then you'll know about how long these things last and when you should stand up and when you should lie flat. Remember, your brain isn't going to tell you that your pressure is too high and maybe not even tell you that your pressure is too low. OK, uh, this just shows with people that pass out uh, a, a separate technique called tilt training. So when you. Um, when you um, uh, stand up or sit, uh, or sit up for a period of time, then what you're doing is you're exercising the blood vessels, making them work for you. And so I prescribe tilt training at home. And it depends how long you can stand. So if you can only stand uh, five minutes, and some, some of you can't stand for other reasons, but if you can only stand five minutes, then you maybe would uh, go up against the wall three or four minutes. And at three, four minutes, then you'd go ahead and sit down. And you do that twice a day until you're tolerating three, four minutes. And then you go five or six minutes and seven minutes. And if you don't have a good signal to tell you, oh, I'm getting faint, you're going to have to have somebody with you or check your blood pressure to know when it's time to sit down. But you'll notice, just like any calisthenics, that you're pushing the envelope. These are various maneuvers you can do to stop yourself from fainting. The, cro the leg crossing maneuver, the uh, uh, the maneuver where you're kind of the, the uh, party posture uh, maneuver. Um, one of the speakers yesterday said you'd need a little you know, cocktail glass to make it a real party posture. Squ <laughs> squatting. And uh, so these are, and the, next to each one of those is shown the amount of 
blood pressure gain you get from each of these. And this is a, uh, a study done right on a tilt table showing uh, how much the squats and how much leg cross is able to increase blood pressure. It's pretty dramatic. And then the other non-pharmacologic thing I want to emphasize is water drinking. How many here know about water drinking? Okay. So how many, do, how many have never heard of water as a way of raising your blood pressure? Okay, so good number. So, so water, if you take a 16-ounce glass of water, and I'm going to give credit to Dr. Vanderbilt and his group at, uh, uh, Dr. Vanderbilt, Dr. Robertson and his group at Vanderbilt, have, yeah, right, uh, has described uh, this. If you take a glass of water, uh, you will raise your blood pressure. So it's got to be 16 ounces. Temperature doesn't really matter, but it can't have any salt or anything in it. And right away, your blood pressure will go up. And so here's where the you do it. And you can see within 10 minutes, your blood pressure is 40, 30, 40 millimeters higher and stays up for about an hour just the time that it takes to get your drugs in. So it's a very good stopgap measure when you get up in the morning to get your blood pressure up. Um, and then salt supplementation. Uh, it reduces a substance called nitric oxide that dilates the blood vessels. So just to so make sure we understand why you have orthostatic hypotension, the vessels are not getting the signal from the brain to say, tighten up. We're standing. So they just stay open. And so we want to do everything we can to get them closed. And so nitric oxide is one thing that keeps them open. So when you give somebody salt, you reduce that, which then means that they are more closed. So that means you're able to tolerate standing up better. Um, so salt is very important. And then just a couple medications I'm going to go through, uh, and, and I'll be done. Uh, Mitodrin. Uh, lasts about four hours, uh, and what it does is it constricts the vessels by imitating the action of the missing nerves. So the nerves, and it's really not the nerves, it's really the brain, but uh, the, missing, the missing action. There's no action. There's no, um, there's, there's no signal. So remember that synapse that I showed you at the beginning, the synapse also that goes from the nerve to the vessel? That synapse uh, is not, uh, not active in MSA. And so we use a drug that will pretend it's there. The only problem is when the synapse is there, of course, the moment you lie flat, it stops firing. So you've got a very nice, flexible system that activates when you want to and inactivates when you don't. When you take a drug, of course, you're stuck with it. It's there for four hours. And whether you want it or not, now these vessels are activated. So it produces a nice increase in blood pressure. And again, don't lie down after you take it because you don't want your blood pressure to go too high. Fludrocortisone, many of you, I'm sure, are, are on fludrocortisone. How many are on fludrocortisone? One, two, not many. Not many people on fludrocortisone. So fludrocortisone is a hormone that replaces one of the kidney hormones. And uh, at very low doses, it makes the blood vessels more sensitive. So it works nicely with either mitodrine or droxydopa to improve the efficiency of the system. OK, and then pyridostigmine is a medication that is, can be helpful. And it makes the, it works up higher. It doesn't work right at the vessel. It works up at one of the synapses that is higher. And it makes that signal flow better. So when you want, uh, and, and for that reason, because it works as part of the signal generating system, it's more in keeping with when you're standing and when you're lying flat. So it actually works a little better as far as not giving you too much of a, of a signal when you're lying flat and giving you more of a signal when you're standing up. Um, so remember uh, physical therapy, water jogging, the exercise program. Um, falls, if you start falling, make sure that somebody's measured your blood pressure lying and standing. Uh, salt is good. And then we've got some sheet of, some, a tip sheet for low blood pressure. Okay. So I'm going to stop here.